Hello everyone, how's it going? In this video, we're going to talk about Lucid trading under the ticker symbol LCID. It has been one of the most speculated stocks in the Nasdaq. Some have said that it could be the next Tesla, while others believe that it's just going to be a giant bubble about to burst. Lucid is one of the few companies that has an actual product rolled out. And as time went on, the stock price action, along with investors' hope, went through a lot of roller coasters, and some are still wondering if this is a bandwagon that they want to hop on. In this video, we're going to look at Lucid and to see if the stock still deserves to have a place in our portfolio. If you appreciate my content, please consider to drop a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Also, please check out the links down in the description section as every help is greatly appreciated. So over the past few days, the price action of Lucid has been tanking and it's going back not only below the $10 level, but below $9. And at the moment, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely certain that this tendency is going to slow down and to lead us to some kind of recoveries in the short term, or maybe not even in the foreseeable future, because here's the thing. Lucid is playing against multiple headwinds. The first one is the fundamental one. Um, so obviously they were saying that, okay, maybe like the deliveries are not going to be as bright as um, they have they have hoped. So this is on one hand. And, the, and, and on the other hand, um, this has like sparkled worries regarding its cash reserves. I remember in very distant videos, I have mentioned like sometimes we have to watch out for those startups or like early stages um, companies cash reserves because once they once their emphasis has been decided on like um, you know stimulating the the growth and stimulating the productivity they will have to make they will have to spend a lot of money to make more money or they will have to spend a lot of money to hope to make more money in this case I think it's more the latter so. They have to hope that things are going to get better. But if you and I think about this, um, like, are we going to see something that's going to look remotely close to 2020? I will say, well, I mean, I will say yes. We're going to see this kind of stuff during our lifetime, that's for sure. But are we going to see it over the next couple of years? That's where I'm really not sure. I think that on one hand, companies, well, not sorry, not companies, but I think that on one hand, um, shareholders, market participants, potential investors, people with money, essentially, people want results. They want delivery numbers, they want profitability, they want asset turnover, um, all, all that kind of stuff. And on the other, we will have the actual economy or the state of the demand for those products. I mean, how many people are willing to, you know, shell out around $100,000 to buy a car? Are there people like these? Yes, of course. Are they growing? They might. Okay, they might. Because even if the economy is in a bad shape, it doesn't mean that the demand for luxury goods um, is going to diminish. Just because, you know, my wage is lagging behind the inflation doesn't mean that everyone relies on wage to make their ends meet. Like, for instance, for people who are really rich, we're talking about those who, if they put their money in the savings account in a bank, they can cash out, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, or maybe even millions. They don't have to worry about the cost of a car. They don't have to worry about the cost of any sort of look, well, what we perceive as luxury goods. For them, it's about the performance. It's about the aesthetics. You know, as long as this product pleases them, they're going to buy it. That's the benefit for Lucid's initial position taking into like the high end section, which by the way, they may lose some now that they're in the lower end as well, because like their productivity, the, um, how can I put this? 
the revenue streams that can allow them to reduce their costs overall has increased, but has also made the business model more fragile. Let me explain. In a company, when you have multiple revenue streams, do you cut one just because it's losing money overall? Maybe not. Generally speaking, it's all about the revenue from that revenue stream minus the cost that that is proper to that revenue stream. In other words, cost of goods sold or of service rendered. And as long as that number is positive and that there is no cannibalization going on, then the company may have a strong motivation to keep those revenue streams. And by the way, you know, right now we're still talking about cars, but in many countries, well, so, in many countries, but in many companies, they have like conglomerates. You know, th those companies have like involvement in so many different branches of the economy that they're basically a chunk of the entire economy. You know, they are basically a mutual fund in themselves. So we're not we're not having one of those situations with Lucid per se, but I, I would say that um, you know. Personally, having more revenue streams is nominally a good thing. But at the same time, if you think about it, you're also more worried about the purchasing power of people who have to rely on wages, you know, who have to look at the price tag. And then you would be kind of like at a stretch between the, the high end and everyone else. Anyway, so this is like the minutia that Lucid will have to look at in the future. But the other thing is, you know, the total number, the overall number of people looking for cars, if we include the high end and the low end, that may go down as time goes on. Um, and if we look at like how the economy has been has been doing, first of all, the stock market took off over the past 10 years or so. As far as people are concerned, maybe they had like a temporary boost regarding their purchasing power, it doesn't mean that they got any wealthier. In, in other words, imagine if your money that you make is not necessarily money, but spending coupons. You know, they are coupons that you can redeem against goods and services, but that you cannot necessarily save to save up in order to accumulate goods. This is, I think, what happened over the past decade. Like, yes, there was more money slush around, but even assuming that some tiny little percentages of this new money, this newly minted and printed money, has gone into people's pockets, I'm not fully convinced that they have saved these in their bank accounts. I think that they have, like, they may have squandered it buying all kinds of stupid things that they don't even need, and that now that this easy money is gone, they're even more in difficulties. Um, for, for those of you who have studied economy, you may remember a saying. So, you know how sometimes we may complain about like overconsumption and uh, the, the credit issues, the debt issues, how households are very, you know, indebted up their eyeballs. And one of my colleagues had this remark. He said, yeah, but have you ever noticed, like, if people spend within their means, we would have gone out of business? Because that's like, you know, a serious chunk of the of the entire economy, a serious chunk of the business through people's doors. So this is why, like, it's a very sharp double-edged sword that right now things seem to be um, going downward, but everyone with the power of influencing the real events in the world, they won't try to like slow down this event to at least make it as painless as possible because it can bring a lot of significant trouble to many different economies around the world if people start to say, well, you know what, I'm going to downgrade my, my spendings, you know, the cars that I wanted to buy, the house that I planned to purchase or the switch, I'm going to delay all that. Well, this is going to have a domino effect on everything else. For example, and this is, mind you, a very small example, okay? So recently, 
um, the inflation near my house, well, near where I live, has increased dramatically. And I have stopped drinking milk for the most part. I have stopped buying a certain brand of like frozen food as well because the price has gone through the roof. I think it doubled. And as a result, I just stopped buying them. Well, the same thing could happen to the real economy as a whole. Anyway, this is a huge tangent for uh, Lucid. But my point is this, the real economy isn't doing so hot. And uh, we have to be careful about it. Okay, that's the that's the takeaway from that. And the other difficulty is that because people seem to be because they seem to care about this issue. Well, the problem is if people start to care about real world, you know, metrics for startup companies, what's that going to do for the com- like what's that going to do with the valuation? Does it mean that we are now evaluating Lucid as a car manufacturer? Because if we do, the market cap of a car manufacturer delivering okay, of course high end EVs, but they're not the only game in town, right? Out- and I'm not even talking about Tesla, I'm talking about like the traditional manufacturers. Well, if that's the case, if we're if we're um, attaching like the value or the valuation of Lucid's price action on the deliveries and the cash numbers and the profitability and the turnover, then how long will it take before people start to one to wonder? Well, if that's the case, I mean, why? You know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't I just buy Toyota? Why wouldn't I just buy Ford? GM and Chrysler, um, maybe not. Okay, um, but like, what about what about those? What about Honda? Like, this is what I'm talking about. I, I, my feeling is, as far as we are concerned, um, we have to be careful about the change of perception about EVs. Like, it has to remain this cool new thing on the block. That people are willing to throw money at it. And to a certain point, it's better if Lucid doesn't sell any car at the moment. And that the market is expecting that Lucid will not sell any car for the upcoming years. Right? Because until then, we don't have to change the metrics to measure this company. We don't have to change the mentality in which we change um in, in which we evaluate Lucid. So this is why I, I would say we need to be careful about whether we want to buy it now. And we also need to evaluate for ourselves this time whether Lucid is a company with a fairly long-term future. And by long-term, I mean, you know, five years from now, are we going are we still going to talk about EVs? Are we still going to talk about Lucid? Well, we have to we have to have an answer, at least for ourselves, an internal one. And then we can talk about like uh, the purchasing points, the entry points, so on and so forth. Lucid is an EV manufacturer that is poised to shake up the industry with the cutting edge technology and designs. While other EV companies have been making strides in industry, Lucent Motors stands out with its advanced battery technology, aerodynamic designs, and commitment for sustainable business model. So, in addition to the advanced technology and design, Lucid is also committed to sustainable business model by using the renewable energy sources to power the production facilities and wants to reduce its environmental impact throughout the life cycle of their vehicles. This commitment is what separates the company from other competitors, in my opinion. Another factor that makes Lucid Motors standing out is the focus on luxury segment. The company's first vehicle, Lucid Air, is a vehicle that is spacious and comfortable, coming with advanced drivers, assistance systems, and many other luxury features. When we look at the long-term tendencies of Lucid price action, it's not hard to see that the bubble that gave so much hope to traders around the world is now bursted. The market is no longer willing to blindly follow the latest hype. 
Because on one hand, the market doesn't want to persist on believing that a beautifully made PowerPoint is better than a good financial report. On the other hand, it cannot afford to sustain the trend when supply chain issues, doubt over flagship companies within the sector, conflicts around the world, higher interest rates, and a looming recession have already been plaguing the real economy out there and also the narrative. The market has long predicted that there will be a bearish market after such a prolonged bull market and that most stakeholders believe that it's going to be a rough patch for the next couple of years. The market peaked twice in the past and if the first peak was caused by pure hype, the second one was triggered by the rollout of actual products. Lucid remains a company that has investment value in the years to come. The main question in everyone's mind is when should they enter in the stock? The long grind to lower price levels is likely caused by the market trends rather than the company fundamentals. So in that sense, things are not as alarming as they may seem. On the other hand, we should remember that sometimes, even if those grinds don't have an actual fundamental reasons, they may still last for a very long time and bring the price to very low levels. Hylions and Paysafe are excellent examples in that case. Lucid had a strong financial performance in 2022. The company reported revenues of about $200 million in Q3 of 2022, a significant increase from just $232,000 of revenue in Q3 of 2021. This strong revenue growth was driven by the launch of Lucid Air, the company's first vehicle, which began deliveries in late 2021. The Lucid Air is a luxury electric vehicle that has been well received by consumers and that has helped establishing the company's reputation as a major player in the sector. Currently, they still have a negative net income, mostly caused by the fixed costs and other operating expenses that should be absorbed once the volume starts to pick up. Overall, Lucid's financial figures paint the picture of a company that is growing its operations but lacks a little bit in discipline and cost control, needing to scale up the operations to start having positive cash flows. Now, let's also cover the shareholder composition in Lucid, because this is a very important factor to determine if the company is better for trading or investing. Lucid is currently held by the institutional buyers for the most part, at more than 70% of the total float. This suggests that the price volatility of Lucid will be lower than other growth stocks, mostly owned by retails. The reason why this might be the case is because institutional shareholders have far more diversified portfolio and can afford to wait, so they don't mind the short-term volatilities. They also tend to stay in for a longer period of time, which is also a good sign for those of us who want to stay for the long run. Some key behavioral differences between institutional and retail shareholders include their investment horizon and also their level of involvement in the corporate governance. In other words, institutional shareholders tend to behave as if they own the company for real, that they are the ones deciding what is going to be the company's decisions, whereas the retailers tend to just behave as speculators. We come in and we aim to make more money than when we first entered in the stock. And this is the end of it. They don't see necessarily like the potentials of the money that there is to make five to ten years from now. Whereas people managing other people's money can sometimes have this kind of opportunity to wait. The short interest of Lucid has been increasing in recent weeks, meaning an increasing number of investors are wondering whether it's a good time to sell the stock. Short sellers borrow the shares from brokers and then they dump it in the market, hoping to buy them back later at the lower price and making the profit from the difference. In the case of Lucid, there is a significant amount of short selling, but in my opinion, it's not sufficiently significant to say that there is a concerted short operation going on against Lucid. So I would say that this has to be put as a secondary reason at most. It's important to note that the short interest may not guarantee a short squeeze, but nevertheless, it's a metric worth monitoring. It's also worth mentioning that people shorting the stock often have a good reason doing so, and that a short squeeze may not happen 
regardless of how many stars are being aligned. Okay, so with all that being said, you know, we've talked about um, the macro the macro trends, we've talked about the company specifics, um, we've talked about like what is the market movements about it. Here's my here's my take. For me, Lucid is a company with a real product. It's a company with real operations. It has an established presence. So I would say that fundamentally it has a future and it has a future in my portfolio. But my exposure in Lucid is fairly low. So I have like enough room in the years ahead of me to buy it. And this of course assumes that PIF is not going to take it private. And as time goes on, maybe this, you know, th this option is behind us. Okay, I'll, I'll be very honest. Maybe this option is already behind us, but it shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like for me, my feeling is, um, as far as Lucid is concerned, I assume that it's going to continue existing within the next decade. I assume that people are still going to buy EV cars. Because I don't think that uh, hydrogen is mature enough as a technology just yet. And we may see it, you know, maybe decades from now, but certainly not one decade from now. And during that period of time, Lucid will become an important player in that sector. And I do expect its shares to take some, va to gain some values. Right? So in that sense, I would say that, um, it's definitely a good news for Lucid to get, to get any cheaper. And will it get even cheaper from here onwards? From the NASDAQ and the S&P's price action, I would say so. And the other thing is, you know, from the length of a typical recession, I would say that we should give it at least three years. Why three years? Because back in 08, I think that for both of these two um, indexes, so S and P five hundred and Nasdaq, it took them about five. Uh, sorry, it took them about three years to go beyond uh, the level back in 07. So I would recommend to start buying Lucid if you haven't done so already, and to maybe keep the exposure between five to eight percent. And to spread your purchases over the course of, personally, I would say over the next few years, like two to three years. Given the magnitude of increases of the stock market over the past decade or so, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the recession takes a few years to get digested and things can get very ugly in the meantime, which I personally fully expect. It doesn't really remove my trust and optimism into lucid in the long term though so this is why i would say i would start to buy lucid you know once once every couple of months and to eventually build up a decent position